So as we get started, uh, just being able to teach one short class, what we're going to talk about tonight is definitely not intended to be an in-depth study. But what it is intended to do is to stimulate our thinking. That's what I want to do. If I do that, if I stimulate your thinking, then I've achieved my goal. A lot of times we make comments in our Christian walk to people in particular that are not Christians or even those that are Christians, really. And we know what we mean. We know what we mean when we use a certain phrase. We understand what we mean. But does the person that we're talking to understand what we mean? One of the things that I constantly uh, talk to people about, in particular those that are part of the Lord's church, one of the things that I talk about is you need to be sure that you are attending a sound congregation. Have you ever made that comment to somebody? you ever used the word sound congregation? What I have recently uh, come to understand is many people don't understand the adjective sound. What do we mean when we say a sound congregation? So if we look at that, if we use the adjective sound, what do we mean? What in the world does that mean? If I talk to someone about things that are going on and, and they ask me, well, is, is this correct according to the Scriptures? What do you, how do you see this? And I say, are you attending a sound congregation? What do I mean by that? So let me give you some examples about that. You know, talking about no deterioration or blemishes, now, some of you, Marvin's not in here, Marvin Whitworth, I don't think, but, but many years ago, when I went to the University of Tennessee, I was privileged to be on the University of Tennessee livestock judging team, okay? So I was able to go across the country as part of the University of Tennessee's livestock judging team. And when we judge an animal... And the way that works, they bring out four animals, and your job is to place those animals one, two, three, four. You put the best one first, and so on. And then you have to go in a room and explain to someone why you did that. And one of the terms I would always use is that they were structurally sound. This animal was structurally sound. There were, they weren't sickle hocked, they weren't cow hocked, they were structurally sound. They, they, everything about their physical appearance and physical makeup was sound, right? Some of you don't, I may be talking over your head when I say sickle hocked and cow hocked, but go with me on this. Structurally sound. If you are inspecting a bridge, they will say it's structurally sound. What about a congregation? Is it structurally sound? Think about that class. Think about that terminology. Who is the authority? Where is the, where is the rule for soundness? Okay? Where is class? When we talk about the congregation, where is the rule for soundness? Where do we go for to determine if it's sound or not? Everybody's holding their Bibles up. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because what I say is sound may not be sound. Okay? If I talk about a Angus heifer, someone within the Angus breed of, of cattle has determined what an Angus heifer's is according to soundness. When we talk about a congregation, we have to go to the Bible. Okay? 
Why is it then that we even have to even have to understand what a sound congregation is? Shouldn't it be evident if we have the absolute authority on soundness? Shouldn't it be evident? Yes or no, class? Should it not be evident? It should be. And I think it is. Okay? However, as we well know, much of the world around us has a different definition for sound congregation, does it not? Most of the world around us does have a different definition. We talk about sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. So class, what is sound doctrine? What is sound doctrine? God's Word. It, it's, it's just what, what we read, right? It's, it's just, just what we read. That's sound doctrine, okay? So, if the teaching of the Scripture tells me that I am to obey the authority of the land, does the Scripture tell me that, class? Okay? then if I do anything other than that, am I adhering to sound doctrine? The answer is no. Right? So let me give you a good example. Because I'm guilty. The Bible tells me that I'm supposed to obey the laws of the land. I cannot, I will confess to you that I have driven on the interstate faster than 70 miles an hour. Okay? Am I adhering to sound doctrine when I do that? There is no if, ands, or buts. I am not, am I? Okay? And, and, and we kind of laugh about it, but it's a very simple, simple thing. So when we talk about adhering to sound doctrine, it has to be it's a yes or no, either we are or we're not. Would you agree with that, class? Okay? So, I just put one scripture up here. There's, there's many, but I, just to make the point, Galatians 1, verses 8 through 10. But even if we, this is the New King James Version, uh, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Okay? Then he repeats it. In verse 9, the same exact thing he repeats and right again in verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again. Okay? So what is sound doctrine? It's this, and anything other than that would be unsound. Correct? Okay, we're all in agreement. So, Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for what? Sound doctrine. Okay? Paul told Timothy, chapter 4, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And the verse goes on, I cut it off, evidently did not mean to, to talk about the fact that they would be listening to fables, the New King James says, Right? So, has that time come? It's here. Okay. It's been here. It was obviously not going to be very long when Paul wrote that before things like that. And we know from the reading of the New Testament that things like that happen. So, I'm going to talk about some things that I think are things we need to consider when talking about sound congregations. Okay? Again, it's not meant to be an in-depth study. These things could be talked about and debated for uh, till the end of time. But I want us to think about it. Okay? Elders, certainly... If you're going to attend a sound congregation, at least in our part of the country, should it be elder-led? 
yes or no class? Why? It's the footprint that Jesus set forth, and that Paul in particular, and then the first century church did appoint elders where? Say, every church, that's right. What does the term every mean? It leaves nothing out, right? It leaves nothing out. They appointed elders in every church. Okay? So, a sound congregation would be elder-led, and only if the elders are qualified and appointed according to the New Testament Scriptures, right? Just because I might get up here and say, I'm Elder John. That don't mean I'm Elder John, right? According to the Scriptures. So, there are people out there who call themselves elder, correct, class? So, a sound congregation would have elders that meet the qualifications of the New Testament Scriptures and are appointed according to the New Testament Scriptures, right? Sound congregation, elder led. So, would it be unsound then for a congregation not to have elders? Who said that? Okay. In our part of the world, and I put under here, our part of the world, there are parts of the world, I'm sure, where there needs to be a congregation that do not have men ready to be elders. But they need to have the goal of training up and raising up elders. Would you agree or not, class? So in our part of the world, we have many congregations that do not have elders. However, there may be a congregation that has elders who meet the qualifications according to the Scripture two or three miles up the road. Should that congregation continue to meet or not. I'm stimulating your thing. I'm not looking for answers, but I'm stimulating our thinking here, okay? Now, let me give you an example. I preached for a number of years, well, for three years, at a congregation with the understanding that they would appoint elders. Okay? They did not have elders when I started. When I talked with them and became their preacher, the idea was that there would be a period of time that they would appoint elders. However, they became very comfortable not having elders. And as I would bring that up with them, you know, and there were qualified men, they did not appoint elders. Okay. They didn't desire the office. Okay. Now, I would go along with that, but does that negate the fact that they need to have elders? Okay. I understand Fred, what you're saying, that their desire is not there, but that's part of the problem in a lot of local congregations is that, and I, I have never been an elder, and it, I cannot understand wholeheartedly having not been the awesome responsibility and task that that is, okay? And so I can understand where the comfort level would be if we didn't have them and how easy it is not to have elders. However, what I want us to think about is what the Scripture teaches. And if we talk about baptism, what the Scripture teaches about baptism, we talk about, uh, we'll go into some other things here, uh, what we do on the first day of the week and all of those things, and we leave out this thing about elders are we correct when we're talking to someone about a sound congregation? That's what I want us to think about. Okay? So would we ever, those of us, most of us in this room, I guess I would not attend a congregation where I could not partake with my brothers and sisters the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. I would not. If it was served quarterly or twice a year, I would not do that. Okay? We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but then would I, why would I, if I had the opportunity without 
tremendous hardship attend a congregation that was not elder-led, according to the New Testament Scriptures. Do we agree that the, that the New Testament teaches that congregations should be elder-led? Do we agree? Okay. So, I, I, back to my story. So, I ended up moving away from that congregation. The congregation does not exist today. Okay. And they are attending congregations that are elder-led. So, if you, uh, so that uh, is in fact what my hope would have been because many congregations around that one, within almost within sight, had were elder led. So, think about that as stimulating our thinking. Uh, how can we obey those who rule over us and be submissive if? There is no one that rules over us. How can we do that? Okay? So think about that. Uh, just something, something to think about because, you know, the traditions uh, sometimes outweigh what the Bible says. Now, you know, there are a lot of congregations where people just, you know, have been there their whole life. Been there... 85 years. And it's hard to hard to, to make that decision, okay? I just you may have a different opinion and that that is fine. I just want to stimulate our thinking, but I do know this. If there was a piano here and an organ over there, I would not be here. Okay? So if that's the case, can I ignore the teaching about elders? Okay? So some think about it. So, sound congregations have, I put teaching by the men, but what I really mean to say is the preaching, uh, uh, the teaching, and the leadership are men. Would that be according to the New Testament Scriptures class? That men do the, do the teaching, the preaching, and are the leadership. The elders and the deacons are men. The servants that serve the... the the Lord's table are men. Would you agree that that is what Scripture teaches? Okay? Now, sound congregations have that. Now, I don't think I can hardly go a week without reading something in the press, which I get all my press now on the phone, you know, and all that kind of. I don't uh, get a newspaper, but there's a lot of things that show up where congregations, even in our general area, are changing their thinking about this right here. Okay? So, if you're going to attend a sound congregation, I would think, according to the Scriptures, that the leadership needs to be coming from, from men. Does it negate the fact that we have godly women that have all kinds of roles in the local congregation. That, that's, but from uh, the leadership of, of the congregation, it should be men. So I put, they, they'll come back and say, you know, no example of teaching in the first century church other than men. And then I put some examples where there are some women, okay, that we read about in the New Testament Scriptures. What's the, what's the difference there? Why, why if uh, why would we not, do, do, we, do we, how am I going to phrase this? Do we negate those scriptures that talk about women who prophesied or women who, who served that uh, may be called deaconesses? Do we ignore those scriptures? Clients? Should we ignore any scripture? However, were those situations in the worship of the church? When the church came together on the first day of the week. Think about that. And think about uh, what, what Paul says about uh, women uh, in the role in church. And we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to mention a couple other things. 
the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Is that according to the New Testament Scriptures? Should we, if we're a sound congregation, should the Lord's Supper be served every first day of the week? If, if it's a sound congregation. What do you think, class? Should that... Is that because we want it that way? Or is it because the New Testament Scripture outlines it that way? Okay, very, very critical. So if we, if we say this is a sound congregation, it has to be according to the Bible, right? So I was raised, and many of you know this, where in a denomination where the Lord's Supper was served twice a year. Okay? And when it was served, it was a production. Okay? It was, it was, it was a production. Now, having said that, what is the response when we're talking to folks about the Lord's Supper being served every first day of the week? What is one of the responses you normally hear from someone that doesn't understand that? It becomes redundant. It loses its meaning. You ever heard that, class? You ever heard that? It loses its meaning. It becomes, it becomes redundant. Okay? Is that a God issue or is that a John issue? or point? Okay? Does that negate the fact that the example set forth and the teaching set forth in the New Testament Scriptures says partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Whether we think it's redundant or not. Right? Okay. If you, he says, don't you think if we go that route, it's redundant to read the Bible more than once? That's a good point. Now think about, think about uh, it may be redundant to go to worship every first day of the week. My point is this. Let's use this example. What is Jesus' teaching, we'll use Matthew, okay, about what I do when someone strikes me on the cheek, when someone hits me? What's his teaching? Turn the other cheek, right? Is anybody in here besides me a human being? Okay, how many, how hard is it? I got a police officer back here. How, you deal with people not turning the other cheek every day, right? So, so how, how hard is that? Does that, if I don't turn the other cheek and I fight back, is, does that negate what Jesus' teaching was? Because I don't like it that way. Just because I don't like it that way doesn't, doesn't negate what he said, right? If some, con some, some organizations have decided it's too much trouble for everybody to get up on Sunday morning and come to church. So we're going to meet on Friday afternoon or Saturday afternoon and we're going we're gonna to have our deal then because that, that way... Everybody don't have to get up on Sunday morning and get there. We like it better that way. Well, maybe that is better for a lot of people. Does that take the place of what we were taught? There's a lot of things in this book. I can tell you from my standpoint, it's very easy. I know why. Jesus didn't make me an inspired writer. There have been about four pages in this thing if, it were, if I were an inspired writer because a lot of stuff in here just doesn't seem practical, doesn't seem right, doesn't seem that, you know, we say, well, you know, that goes against human nature. Does someone dying on a cross and being raised from the dead 
on the third day to give us hope of eternity in a place called heaven? It, it, is that human nature? So think about what, what I'm talking about here when I talk about these things. So we talked about singing a sound congregation according to the New Testament Scriptures, not according to John, should be, the worship should be singing only with no instrumental accompaniment. Would you agree, class? Okay? Why? Because that is the example given forth in the New Testament Scripture. Now, well, well, you got, you mean, I mean, I've got this talent that God gave me to play an instrument. And I want to use it for God. Well, my mind, that, can make, that could make sense to a lot of people, couldn't it? I really want to use it. But you know what? God wants us to be submissive to what He has taught us. Even though we enjoy doing X, whatever, God wants us to be submissive to what He's taught us. So would it be unsound to sing with instruments during worship service? Sound congregation should be without instruments. Would it be unsound? Okay. Sound congregations have members who submit to the elders. We talked about elders to start with. I believe that a congregation would be unsound if you have half the congregation that's bad-mouthing the elders and the other half that's submitting to the elders. I've been in that situation. You may have. Sound congregations have its members who understand the New Testament teaching about submitting to those who rule over us. Right? Unless we have elders that are blatantly doing things that's opposed to Scripture, we have an obligation to submit to the leadership of the elders. Do we not, class? Okay? We do. And that is why I believe that sound congregations have members that attend services and make worship a priority. Okay? Sound congregations have members that make these things a priority. Well, do I have to be there on Wednesday night? Do I, class? According to the New Testament Scriptures, I can't point to a Scripture that says, Thou shalt be there on Wednesday night. But I can point to Scriptures to say that I need to submit to the direction of the elders. And if the elders have set forth this time to meet, then I need to make it a priority, if at all possible, to be here. Okay? Same thing on Sunday night. I need to make it a priority if at all possible, to be here. Does the New Testament Scripture say, Thou shalt meet on Sunday evening? Okay? However, am I showing respect to the elders if I'm not here? That alone, the Lord. But am I showing respect to the elders if I'm not here? So, is a congregation unsound... Think about what I'm saying. Is a congregation unsound if we're not supporting the elders, the leadership of the elders? If that's the case, why is it? What makes it unsound if that's the case? I'm not saying it is or it's not. Okay? I'm riding the fence up here, okay? So I, I'm not saying it is or it's not. But if it is, what makes it unsound? If the, if the members are not submitting to the leadership of the elders, what, what makes it unsound? Do 
does the Bible teach submissiveness to the leadership of the elders? The Bible teaches that we should... I want you to look at this verse. We, preachers have... Man, we wear this one out, right? We wear it out. Okay? We talk about attending the assembly. What does this verse say? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Okay? Now, I've just pulled a verse out here. Please understand that. I've not gone before and after. Please understand that. Okay? But just in the, in the nature of what we're talking about here, which assembly does it specify that we not forsake? It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. To me, that means when, we, when, the, when the church assembles, we should not forsake that. Does it specify now, obviously, obviously, I'm talking about the New Testament church meeting on the first day of the week. I, I get that, okay? My point is, though, it doesn't, it just says not forsaking our, the assembling of ourselves together. That's my point. So, congregations that are sound do what? Follow the elders' leadership if it is based, if it's scriptural, right? What's that? That's right. So, my my concern and the reason I bring this up is is uh, I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. What happens is in our communities around us, and we can go Nashville, Murfreesboro, Franklin, all around, we have congregations that are all in their, in their own realm trying to do what they believe is sound according to the scriptures. The problem is that we have many congregations that are refusing to be sound. They're not, they know what is sound and they're refusing to be sound. Okay? So, let me give you an example. Congregation not too far up the road has now decided that the ladies will serve the Lord's Supper. Okay? They've also decided that they will have one service with instruments and one service without. Now, if you are someone who is outside the Lord's church, how do you determine which one of those is sound? Okay, how do you determine what is sound? So it's up to us to teach what, is, what the Bible says about being sound. Okay, it's, a, it's up to us. And so... We have an obligation to do that, I think. So, what should not be considered in the last minute or two here in finding a sound congregation? What should not be considered, at least immediately? Dynamic preachers. First consider what the man is preaching. Okay? Great speakers are great. Okay? I mean, I love to hear them just as good as anybody else. But if they're not preaching sound doctrine, we're in trouble, right? Don't consider the dynamic speaking ability until you consider what is spoken and taught. Okay? Children's activities. It's great. I had two young boys at one time. I've got a grandson now. It's great when congregations have activities and things for the children. However, first consider what is taught. Then consider those things, okay? Consider what is taught. Don't just attend a congregation because they have, you know, a great Mother's Day Out program. Those are great things, don't get me wrong. But don't choose a congregation based on that. Choose first what is being taught. 
small groups, youth groups, senior groups, etc. All great things. I would argue that they're fantastic things. However, you don't choose a congregation base just because there's a good youth group that does, has a lot of activities. Okay? Please choose a congregation. Consider what is taught and who is worshipped. Okay? Consider those things first. Next, who attends? How many people know folks that attend a certain congregation because of who else attends there? Maybe a senator attends there. Maybe, maybe the president of your bank. Or maybe, you know, it, it's good uh, community status to attend this particular congregation. We need to consider what is taught, not who is attending there. Okay? So, the other thing, this hits home to me. We should never consider first that my family attends there. Consider what is taught. My family, all my family, all Linda Gale's family attends denominational congregations that are unsound. Okay? If I just went along and went where my family went, I'd be in trouble. Okay? We cannot choose a congregation strictly based on the fact that my family attends there. It has to be what is taught first. Is it sound doctrine that is taught? So, as I close, I've talked about is it sound doctrine? How do we know that it's sound doctrine? We have an obligation to get in this book ourselves, do we not, class? We have an obligation to rightly divide this, this book. We have an obligation to know what is sound and what is not sound according to this book only. We have that obligation. That's how we know. Consider these things. I uh, like to say, you know, just kind of wetting your appetite, but, but hopefully when we talk to people about sound congregations and sound doctrine, that we consider these things. Uh, I appreciate the class.